a globalizing world. In the second half of the 18th and the first half of the 19th century, a number of colonial empires stretch out across the globe. European powers including Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, the Dutch Republic, Denmark, and Sweden traded in tobacco and sugar from the Caribbean, spices, cotton, and tea from South and East Asia, silver from Latin America, gold and slave from Africa. To do so, they conquered colonies large and small in all these areas, everywhere trying to force the local population or imported slave and servant to produce the communities in demand on the international market. They built fortification to protect their trading posts, port and shipping lane, both from each other and from unconquered local forces. Wars between European empires were frequently folk in the colonies, and their possession and the domination of the sea road connecting them became an increasingly important reason to wage war in the first place. The War of Australian Succession, 1740 until 1748, the Seven Years' War, 1756 until 1763, the American Revolutionary War, 1775 until 1783, as well as the French Revolutionary Wars, 1792 until 1802, and the Napoleonic Wars, 1803 until 1815, were all folk on a world scale. From the American Revolutionary War onward, a strong ideological element was infused into this international conflict, reaching an apogee in the French Revolutionary Wars, when the French often encountered ideologically inspired supporters in the countries in which they folk. National and imperial boundary lines blurred. To give but one example from the essays that follow, after the Dutch Republic became the Batavian Republic in 1795, the French and the revolutionary Dutch Batavian allies went to war against the British and their own counter-revolutionary Dutch Orangis allies over the long-contested South African Cape Colony, Five Hotel Gateway to the Indian Ocean, China and the Spice Island, Australia and the South Pacific beyond. Colonial empires offered convenient places to stow away criminals and political opponents, and convicts were also used to expand imperial frontier zone. The Dutch East India Company looked up its political enemies far away from Indonesia on Robben Island, just off Cape Town. The French deported to Guyana, its dry guillotine from 1795 onward. The British sent convict from Britain, Ireland and the colonies to Australia, and from India to Southeast Asia and the Andaman Island. As metropolitan labor markets strain under the wake of escalating demand for naval and merchant seamen, plantation workers and infantrymen for the military defense of colonial outposts, imperial rulers use the law to generate a highly mobile, super exploitable convict labor force to build and maintain the material infrastructure of expansion. Another solution was to impress, conscript, and crime workers for military service afloat and ashore. A third was using a rising proportion of foreign-born workers both from around the Atlantic and beyond, as did the Dutch and British East, East India fleets. A fourth was employing slaves as sailors and soldiers on board ship. The scramble for cheap labor, in fact, was so intense that even slaves on board slave ships were put to work, commonly performing household tasks such as preparing food and at times sailing the ship or fighting off enemies. After Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807, it sometimes replaced white soldiers with liberated Africans from intercepted slave ships. 
Price Negroes, whom naval authorities disembarked in colonies in the Caribbean or on Mauritius, where they were enlisted into army or indentured for up to 14 years. Sailing or lordship was expensive and merchantile and naval authorities tried to economize on the number of hands and on the wigs they paid them as well as on the space, food and drink available to both crew and human cargo. Discipline in turn was harsh and the experience of the lash was broadly shared below deck. While on board, the material circumstances of slave, convict, and sailors often differed only by degree, and indeed, mutinous convict, though rarely slave as far as we know, sometimes received critical help from one or more crew members. Such shared experiences must at time have extended to soldiers in port and on shore, who also suffered from harsh discipline, low pay and bad food, and much like their comrades afloat, often had to resort to desertion or mutiny so as to escape military service. Knowledge of the ocean world political geography, its shifting zone of slavery and freedom, imperial domination and peripheral autonomy was critical to mutineers, whether slave, sailor, or convict. Conquering the quarter deck and becoming master of the ship was, after all, only the first step in a successful mutiny. After that, the ship had to be taken to a spot where the mutineers could sell it or at least get ashore safely. This meant that the mutineers either had to be able to navigate the ship themselves or had to find someone from among the original crew willing and able to do so. During the late 17th and early 18th century, European mutineers had been able to continue sailing their ship as pirates, but by the mid-1720s, as the hold of the maritime empires over the seaways of the Atlantic Titanic, this possibility disappeared from the northern hemisphere. Elsewhere, of course, piracy was still an option, for instance in the South Pacific, which was only beginning to, the, to be integrated into Britain's carceral archipelago. But in the late 18th century Atlantic and Caribbean, the option of fleeing toward autonomous zone was curtailed, and successful mutineers were forced instead to depend on a keen sense of where the authority or jurisdiction of one empire fizzled out and where that of a second one began, or in the case of slave mutineers, where slavery still flourished and where it had been abolished already. All evidence suggests that such knowledge was available, for example, about abolitionist network or the political and juridical circumstances which made it advisable to drop weapon and ship papers overboard and instead trust local authorities. We know little about the nature of the network through which such information circulated, but it seemed that they were kept up to date in rapid response to the constantly shifting political realities of a world consumed by war and revolution in a world characterized by increased subaltern mobility and a rapidly expanding print culture. Both authorities and mutineers depended on news about political shift to determine how forces had changed or which rules applied. As global context grew, so did faster communication even before technical innovation at that speed. Official news, however, didn't always spread with the same speed as Plotarian communication network, and this wasn't necessarily for the disadvantage of mutineers. For example, the sailors in the British squadron at the Cape knew about the Nor Mutiny before their superiors did. This surreptitious line of communications mean that revolutionary movements spread globally even when authorities were at pains to prevent it. In the case of the Nor Mutiny, from British home waters outward to the Mediterranean squadron, the Cape, the fleet in the Indian Ocean, and the Hermione frigate in the Caribbean.
revolution at sea. Between the 1760s and late 1840s, revolutionary ferment broke out around the Atlantic world, erupting in multiple places, spreading inward and outward, and moving multi-directionally across Europe, the Americas, and the Caribbean. Thank you.